Thanks, Stephanie and Rebekaya. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Lauren. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I just wanted to take a quick sec to introduce myself because um, y'all haven't heard so much from me so far in the groups. I've been focused on taking all those notes that, that we after the meetings uh, to capture all of the great discussion and ideas that are coming up. Um, but today we decided to switch things up a little and Jim is graciously taking notes um, and I'll be your co-facilitator along with Gizikaya. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, though I, I'm currently living in Portland, Maine, uh, I did live in the Valley for a couple of years while I was in grad school and um, went to UMass Amherst and um, really valued my time there. And I'm just extremely grateful to be part of this process and working with this community and this group of people. Um, so thanks for having me. And um, just gonna share my screen with a few slides to kind of kick off the discussion. So bear with me one moment here. All right, can everyone see the slides that I'm sharing? Thumbs up, yeah, great, thanks. Um, so to start off the conversation today, we wanted to kind of um, reflect on the idea of climate resilience. Um, so as we've been talking about climate change with this group and with all of our task group members, uh, what keeps coming up is that people's lives are very unstable right now uh, in lots of different ways um, in terms of things like housing, food, transportation, job security. Um, and all of these things are affected by climate change. And we've also been talking about the quality of life um, and how difficult it is for some members of the community to live in Amherst and how wonderful it is for others. Um, and how those things are also connected to local governance. Um, so we've been having these conversations around climate mitigation, around reducing our emissions and taking care of our environment um, in the context of transportation specifically in this group. And then we've also been talking about the ways in which transportation can impact our quality of life and our access to things like food and housing and jobs. Um, so these ideas reflect those two priorities of the plan, which are climate mitigation and climate resilience. Um, and we want to keep both of these things on the table as we're moving forward in, in crafting this plan. Um, so we wanted to just start off with a quick minute of reflection around what, what climate resilience means to you and how you might define it if you were trying to define climate resilience for yourself. Um, so I'm just gonna give folks a minute to sit and think with that um, and then open it up for folks to share um, if anyone is feeling inspired. I should have gotten the Jeopardy music to play in the background. Lauren, could you rephrase the question? Sure. Um, so when you hear the, the words climate resilience, what comes to mind? Um, what, what might that look like for you? Um, and how would, maybe how would you know that the community is becoming more resilient? Um, what would that mean for you? Okay. Another way to think about it. Climate resilience is our ability to get through some sort of disaster or negative impact from climate change, right? Yeah, I was, yeah, I was holding off on providing a definition first because I want folks to sort of be able to think about it from their own experience. But, okay. but yeah, um, but thank you for adding to that, Gizikaya, yeah. and and that is sort of the the basic gist. Yeah. So does anyone have? 
with kind of a basic example that I think that when we look at just increased quantity and severity of storms that are happening, then it becomes, right, so there has always been severe winter weather in New England, but now as we're looking at that further changing, it's like, what is, who then does now having a generator become like a primary necessity of, mm -hmm. um, you know, having power or what are the systems that are in place with that? Or as we look at the impacts of climate on farming, like who are the farmers who have the capacity to have the different equipment or irrigation systems or uh, greenhouses or whatever the other things are that are needed to adapt to uh, the changes with that. So it's just as we're, um, experiencing the changes in these climates and then the some of we have all of the things that have made our community not necessarily fully resilient or people don't necessarily have access to the resources that they need even without climate change and then we add upon that this layer of a whole new set of challenges and how do we as a community and the members of the community respond to that yeah thanks Lev. I, I really want to highlight what you said there about this idea of adapting and, and having the capacity to adapt to the changes that are underway and that are coming. Um, that's definitely something that I'll, I'll touch on on the next slide. Um, but I'd love to give someone else the chance to jump in um, if anyone is feeling inspired. I know we have a few folks with their videos off, but Penny or Tessa, if you are feeling inspired, please feel free to share your thoughts. Okay, I will. I'm new to the climate change. I really, um, I'm not sure how, I mean, I know how it works, but I like to hear what other people have to say before I kind of like chime in, so. Of course. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for sharing. And hi, Tracy, welcome. We're just um, talking about resilience and what that means to us and how we understand it in our lives. So maybe this is a good point to, to move on to the next slide. Um, so one common definition of climate resilience that we encounter is um, a community's ability to bounce back from shocks and stressors like floods, like droughts, like power failures, and even pandemics. Um, but what we've heard over the course of our meetings together is that bouncing back to the way things have been is not really enough. Um, that's not enough to aspire to and it's, it's not enough for this plan. Um, we've been acknowledging as a group that bouncing back to the way things have been only makes sense if you're starting off from a stable place. And much of our community is living without that stability. We've been recognizing that that also means that much of our community is not prepared to fully engage with climate change. And that's a problem because we know we need to have everyone engaged to, to solve this crisis. So instead of bouncing back, I wanted to offer a different definition um, or a different way to think about resilience as bouncing forward. Um, moving towards stability, toward better outcomes, and especially for our renters, our low-income communities, our communities of color. Um, and this means sharing risks and opportunities more equitably within town. Um, so when it comes to something like transportation um, or waste or communication, which is a, a piece of this group's work as well, one example could be creating formal systems that build community connections to improve the communication between the town and groups like renters, like low-income community members and communities of color, communities of diverse language backgrounds, people of different abilities. Lots of the groups that we've been talking about have historically not necessarily been part of these types of processes. Um, so I just wanted to offer that as an example of how we might think about bouncing forward in the context of climate resilience. 
Um, and I know and I'm sure that this group has lots of other great ideas about what that could look like. Um, so that's part of what we'll get into today. But for now, I'm going to turn it over to our co-chairs, Darcy and Laura, um, to review some of the major actions and big ideas that have come out of our discussion so far and tee up our main conversation for um, the rest of our session today. So Laura and Darcy, take it away. And I will share my slide with the actions. Oh, Darcy, you're muted. Laura, do you want to take it away? I was going to say the same thing to you, Darcy, so <laughs> it's... <laughs> um, yeah, I... These are, I guess, four things that came out of the last two sessions. Um, two of which are transportation related and two of them are waste related. Maybe it would be helpful just to read through them and answer any questions folks may have, clarify anything that comes up. So the first, the, the transportation, well, do you wanna do transportation, Laura? Sure. Um, so the first two are related to transportation. Um, number one being commit to advocating for increased public transit to essential services like voting, doctor's offices, in food deserts, areas of low car ownership and areas of low transit access. The second idea that came out of our discussions related to transportation is to install a formal safe path to connect the East Hadley Road apartment complexes to the multi-use path. And I, I just flag here that, um, you know, these are two of many actions that will come out of this process related to transportation. And so, um, you know, don't feel stressed if something we've talked about is not listed here or something you think we need to do is not listed here yet. And in fact, um, I would just say that that'll be part of our discussion to follow is, is talking about what's missing and um, what needs to be added. Great. Um, I see that Tracy has her hand raised and I just wanted to open it up to. Oh, so I had, I mean, procedurally, did you wanna talk about the transportation ones first or? Do you want to go through all of them and then have us give comments? Yeah. How do you, how do you guys want to structure? Yeah, I think we're going to go through them all quickly okay. just so that That's everyone fine. has a, a comprehensive picture and then we'll launch into the discussion. Thanks for asking. So the other two um, are waste related and um, Number three is implement a townwide curbside composting program that's inclusive of large and small apartment complexes. And four is ban the commercial use of environmentally harmful materials like single use plastics in town. Um, so, and again, that this is just, you know, a couple of the possible um, waste related actions. So before we get into the discussion, are there questions about these actions or anything that folks would like clarified? Um, I see Samantha has raised her hand. Um, I can't see everyone right now, so. Um, but Samantha, if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself. <laughs> Okay, that's the Zoom bomber, so let's kick that person out. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Thanks They're Stephanie. gone. Sorry about that. Yep. Great. Um, so I saw Brenda, you had a hand up. 
and then we'll go to Tracy. Go ahead, Brenda. So um, my, my question, again, is, is a bit procedural also in terms of like, what is our goal today? Um, and what, what will we be doing with these four goals here? Um, and then the second part is I see that three of them, that the last three are very concrete. Um, the first one is just committing to advocating. So I don't see that as um, how that would be measurable to see, um, I'm not seeing any specific uh, strategies around increasing public transit. So is that something that we might be looking at today to, to create uh, specifics around that? Um, so that's, those are my Absolutely. questions. Thank you. Those are great questions, Renda. Thank you. Um, and yes, that's exactly the idea for, for the conversation. Um, so I think for right now, I, I want to stick to clarifying questions about the actions themselves, but then we're going to launch into exactly the discussion that you just described, looking at where are these actions, where do they need further um, clarification, or we need to build on them, or we need to fill in gaps, what are the things that are missing, um, what are the things that we want to elevate, um, all of that. So you're, you're headed in exactly the right direction with your thinking, so thank you. Um, Tracy. And then love. Oh, you're muted, JC. I mean, so I had mainly, um, I had sort of split them up in my own mind between the, the transportation ones and the infrastructure ones. But one of the things, I had a question about the first one is, and, and I guess it's a little, to me, it's a little hard just to comment on them without also thinking about what, what I would like to add. <laughs> so in terms of like, am I just clarifying or am I just, you know, you know what I, I mean, they all kind of build on each other. Um, but my question I had, I mean, I was thinking about other essential services too, like work and so on. And in the work that um, I, that the TAC has been doing, the Transportation Advisory Committee, you know, one of the things we focus a lot on is connecting like where people live to where people need to go and those mm -hmm. connection points. Um, I mean, I, I sort of had a big qu picture question about, about serving all the areas of low transit access. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, again, focusing on the nodes about where people live and where people need to go. I'm not sure it's desirable to have transit everywhere um, because it does seem like that can actually contribute to sprawl. And it's also very expensive, you know, mile by, you know, cost per mile and so on. Um, so <clears throat> that was one of the things on my mind with that one. Um, and on the second one about the multi-use path, I, I wasn't sure what the multi-use path is referring to. Um, because mm -hmm. along East Hadley Road, there has been construction lately on a multi-use path. And they're actually extending it, I think, to the Hadley line, including sidewalks on both sides. So part of me was thinking that it was referring to the rail trail, you know, and in terms mm -hmm. of accessing the mall, which that's a huge issue. Um, and that also ties back to the first item about that one of the really critical needs on East Hadley Road is having better public transit um, to get to the mall and so on. It's not just about being able to walk. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, thank you. And, and, and also just that there are, a, there are other, dense housing developments, including affordable housing projects like throughout Amherst. So I'm not sure, and some of those do not have good, I mean, East Hadley Road actually with the new construction, they actually have much better pedestrian access than other areas, you know, like mm -hmm. Village Park that has to go along East Pleasant and so on. And so I don't know if we mm -hmm. just want to single out East Hadley Road. Yeah, these are great comments. I, I, um, I think one important thing to say about that strategy in particular is that it's a very specific instantiation of a more general principle that we were hearing around exactly what you were saying, connecting folks to the things that they need and doing so in a safe way, um, in an accessible way. Um, so, so what, so I guess, sorry, so what is the multi-use path referring to? Is it referring to the yeah. rail trail? It is referring to the rail trail. I think oh. maybe there's just some confusion around terminology there, so my apologies. Um, so, Love, did you have something to add? Your question? Um, yeah, I think this is a, 
a good segue um, from what Tracy was just sharing and thinking about public transportation. Um, and I will acknowledge I have uh, more context for the conversations around public transportation actually in more rural areas than Amherst, but I think that um, kind of building off of what Tracy was saying about the reality of the truly cost prohibitive nature of having over like a broad geographic area, the amount that makes it really convenient. I think there's also something that needs to be considered that is absolutely happening in some of the more rural areas of the Commonwealth around just like alternate transportation possibilities. So are there more active just vans or sort of heavily subsidized taxi, Uber, Lyft kind of services and those kinds of things. Um, and I recognize there's a that doesn't have the same climate benefits as many people riding the bus, but wanting to think consciously about um, when school is in session on the bus routes, we have quite impressive public transportation for an area of this population density. And yet we still know from folks that it's really um, problematic for getting to and from work and grocery shopping and those kinds of things. So um, I am super far from a transportation expert, but I guess wanting to dig into that to make sure we're actually like advocating for the thing that helps. Um, and then the other part of that that's related to using public transportation for, um, for essential services is that um, the PBTA continues to have a limit that is around the number of bags that you are allowed to have on the bus, which makes it work very well for students and not that well for folks who are using it for grocery shopping or have strollers with them, et cetera. Um, and it gets enforced uh, kind of by the driver. And so sometimes yes and sometimes no, but that's not, uh, not being able to predict whether the driver is going to let you on with your groceries is not an, it's not a mechanism that you can like hoping for that or fingers crossed for that makes it very hard to then take the bus to a grocery store or to a food pantry etc so that's kind of a an advocacy point around utilization of the public transportation that we currently have and who it's designed to work for that's awesome thank you so it's sort of about reframing that first item to be more reflective of targeted advocacy that we know is addressing specific problems that are getting in people's way. Yeah, and to be clear, I don't, um, it may be advocating for more buses. I'm not saying that that isn't the right solution. I just know that in more rural areas, there's been lots of conversation about what the right way is to connect people to those, you know, services. And then there could also be some advocacy around the routes and schedules and con year round continuation of the public transportation that we already have. That's great. Yeah, thinking in a more multimodal way about what's the most sort of effective way to, to meet those needs and at the same time um, think about how that intersects with, with climate change. Um, so I love this and I love that folks are already sort of launching into the core discussion. So I think let's just kick it off. Um, our original sort of thinking for the format is to ask folks to go around um, and give everyone three minutes to share their thoughts. That way we make sure that we hear from everyone. And then if we have extra time, we'll open it up for further discussion. Um, so the, the question to frame this, this section of our discussion is really considering this list. What would be the most meaningful outcomes of the plan for you and why? And is there a key action that you feel is missing from this list? Are there things that you would change about how this list is, is written, is framed? Um, and what surprises you about this list or makes sense to you about this list in the context of our conversations so far? Um, so I'm gonna maybe ask one of our participants who has not spoken yet to kick us off if folks feel comfortable. Um, so Penny or Tessa, I believe we have not heard much from you. Um, would one of you two be willing to kick us off? Yeah, uh, just to clarify the question you're asking, like what we think about the overall plan. Yeah, I guess what would your 
top priority on this list be or is your priority not there and it needs to be added and and what would that be if if it's not on the list uh probably for me if i was to choose one most important it would be number four only because mm -hmm. i feel like that's a direct like i feel like um environmentally harmful materials are really big and i know um they can cause a lot of especially with uh littering them it can also make our community seem like seem dirtier i guess so getting rid of that and like cleaning up the streets and making it seem a lot nicer could also help to motivate people if they see it in their community being cleaner it might make them feel more environmentally friendly if they notice that these harmful materials are being taken out of like daily life yeah. thanks Jessa. <clears throat> well um i guess number two seems like a pretty um good thing to start doing installing um you know it, the composting in, in apartments and you know leading that off so people can be more prepared to get rid of their trash instead of throwing all their plastics and all their whatever all together. And it kind of brings the, it kind of brings you into a community because you will have to be communicating with everybody and um, how to, um, to uh, start this project off. Okay. Thanks, Penny. Yeah, that's a really great point um, to, to think about how, how these things are going to be happening in community and how they can actually have benefits for community building as well as for the environment. Right. Awesome, Thank thanks. You. Thanks for sharing. Um, who would like to go next? Um, I'll share. It's Brenda. Um, I, I would love to see the, the list of the other things that aren't here. <laughs> um, so let's see. In, in number three, I'd want to make sure that restaurants, businesses are included in the curbside composting. It mentions mm -hmm. that. Um, and... Uh, I, number one is, although that wasn't the area that I worked on is really important and um, which is the increased public transit. Um, and would love to see all, all levels of that in encouraging more biking with bike lanes and um, small shuttles to be able to serve locales that the buses can't get to due to over overpasses um, so yeah I guess they're they're all important <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and can I also ask what is the the, the time frame is there a um, of which these goals would be would be proposed to be met yeah great question um, so the framework for the plan is that there will be um, priorities that are set for the next three to five years, and then some longer term potentials, benchmarks, targets that we're thinking of trying to meet along the way toward the goal of achieving carbon neutrality. Um, and, and sort of some of the, the structural changes that we've been talking about that we might um, use to gauge our progress moving forward in the longer term. But the, the goal is for the plan to really focus in on actions that can be implemented or at least initiated, started in the next three to five years. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Brenda. Jeff, I see you turned your video on. Great to see you. Thanks for being here. Does that mean that you wanted to jump in? Sure, I'll, I'd be happy to jump in. These are 
a, a great list. I was really surprised, I guess, to see number four with the environmentally harmful materials. I would thought we'd <laughs> gotten rid of those already. But the, um, so that one surprised me. On the mm -hmm. first one, I thought there's been some really interesting discussion about um, transit and I'm thinking about our population and as the demographic changes and, and, and we see an older population that resiliency component to um, our population is something that I think is, is really going to be tightly woven in with this as we try to find ways of making sure that people that can no longer drive have some way of getting to those important destinations. So I'm curious to know how the group sees this playing out in the, in the future. Yeah, can you say a bit more about that, Jeff, for folks who maybe haven't thought as much about this issue? Well, you know, we're seeing, I was thinking personally, and my neighbors are all, and I'm getting older. And uh, I know last year when the snows came down, um, you know, people that used to be able to shovel their driveway couldn't. And uh, so we had to figure out ways to, helping out or making sure that someone had some help and uh, or knew an answer to that. And I, I think when it comes to transportation, you know, we're going to need those same types of solutions. Maybe not a one size fit all, fits all, but something that address someone, someone's needs on a personal level, something they're comfortable with. Um, not everyone is, you know, comfortable with a handout or an offer for assistance, but sometimes they're happy if you can provide them with some, you know, a venue of solutions. And, uh, mm -hmm. and some of those were already mentioned, like Uber type of um, ridership options. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Tracy's point about whether or not um, providing transit access is, is seen as a land use control. I thought that was interesting and I had mixed feelings about that. Um, you know, is, is, that, is it the tool the, of choice? And, and so I'd be interested in knowing if that was um, perceived as a possible solution for, you know, urban sprawl, <laughs> so to speak. Interesting. So sort of thinking about transportation planning as a way to avoid urban sprawl and, and keep transit systems more um, accessible. I also want to pick up on one thing you said around um, sort of the coordination that went on with trying to figure, help folks figure out how they could get their driveways plowed or um, how they could be mobile when they're facing a situation like that. And it really comes back to what Penny was saying earlier around community and, and being able to um, collaborate with folks in your community to solve those localized problems in a way that meets those individual needs. Um, and that's sort of a theme. I know, Jeff, you haven't been with us for all of the meetings, but that, that has been a theme that has come up um, repeatedly is sort of the idea of the importance of community and, and building community connections in order to create the foundation for resilience. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, Laura, yeah. Thanks, Lauren. Um, yeah, I just wanted to maybe add something to number one um, and to broaden add out a little bit. I think um, one of the things we talked about in the first meeting that, that Lev brought up was, you know, the connection between access to transportation and access to jobs. Um, and so I think I'd want to expand that to be not just essential, to, to make sure that jobs is, and, and employment and quality employment is part of an essential service. Um, and then that sort of got me down thinking about communication. And this group is, is meant to cover non building infrastructure of which communication is a, a piece. Um, and we haven't spent much time on that, but I think um, if we think about communication in terms of access to internet, um, as well as in terms of, you know, having a stronger communication network across town um, from a resiliency standpoint, um, I think access to internet supports communication and also supports employment potentially that could be done remotely. Um, it supports more 
equitable access to to schooling right now. Um, and so I just want to throw that out there as another um, action that this that that will be part of this group's output. Thanks, Laura. Yeah. Lev, you're called out there. Do you want to add anything to Laura's comment? Um, nope, I think she, <laughs> yeah. Sounds good, just wanted uh, to offer. No, appreciated that, um, bringing back around. Well, sure, I guess the one thing that I'll add is that I think that um, that really speaks to the need for, as we're thinking about transit, that it can't be a town-specific approach. It has to be looked at on a regional level. Um, and mm -hmm. that folks are working in all different places and at all different schedules, et cetera. So, um, but I really, I appreciate centering back to that in terms of the reality of someone can actually live without a car, what that means. Thanks. Stephanie, I saw your hand. Yeah, I just um, wanted to sort of follow up on what Laura said about communication too, that I, um, in creating the network, it seems like we also have to really address the language barriers that exist in the community and that that needs to be part of any kind of network that's developed. Um, and not just, um, you know, not just uh, in sort of cultural language barriers, but also for those who have um, disabilities that may um, affect them, you know, either uh, vision or hearing that somehow we need to address that in a, in a really substantial way too. Thanks. So, Tracy, Lev, did you have any, um, I know you've already spoken, but we, we have some extra time. So I, I'm gonna open it up for folks to, yeah, Tracy, please go right ahead. Um, so when Jeff was talking, I mean, one of the things I was thinking about is just, well, there are a few different points. One, and, it, and to me, some of it comes back to the multi-use path, um, is that, you know, how important it is to have connect, like to have year round access to um, sidewalks and so on, um, you know, including, you know, when, <clears throat> I mean, we're gonna have daylight savings time soon and then it's gonna be dark a lot more and when people are trying to travel, um, I mean, personally, because I live near the Amherst Hadley line, I think a lot about that sidewalk that was built along Route 9 that goes from the, Amher from the Amherst line to the Hadley Mall and how little support there has been in the last few years to um, keep it shoveled and accessible in the winter, which means that all the people who used to walk in the street are like back walking in the street. So um, that's something I've spoken to um, Joe Comerford's office about a number of times, but it's sort of at an impasse, but just so with the multi use path. If you're thinking about the rail trail that's actually not plowed in the winter. And there's actually some people who want it to be used for recreational purposes. Um, so just, you know, defining where you draw a line between the recreational and the transportation aspects. Um, and also the lighting piece like lighting and sidewalks are just so essential too. Um, <clears throat> not just there, but like throughout town and having them be safe. Um, for older people, I mean, one thing in terms of trying to use, for people who don't drive and who perhaps have disabilities that, that they're eligible for van service. I mean, it really does, if somebody's dependent on van service to get to essential appointments or to work or whatever, it, can, it takes a really disproportionate amount of their day to do that, is that it's not, <laughs> I mean, I think to Lev's point is looking at alternative models and alternative services that can be offered because typically on both ends, the person is waiting a lot of time. And um, so like a one hour or, you know, a lot of doctors will only see you for say 30 minutes, but it could end up being like three or four hours out of your day because the van will come when the van can come and then you go and then you wait. And then the, it's just, it's a lot of effort and a lot of time. Um, so I keep thinking about just in terms of, and I do think about transportation all the time, but just in terms of like safe streets and complete streets and just making sure that our transportation infrastructure is serving everybody to the extent that it can. Um, I agree with Liv's point about um, having the year round transportation because there is such a gap 
when the five colleges aren't in session and they cut back the services that are paid for predominantly by students. Um, <clears throat> and um, also just in terms of the infrastructure part of our transportation infrastructure group, I mean, one thing I was thinking about too is just some of the bigger picture stuff related to zoning and related to like sewer and water expansion. I mean, is that part of our infrastructure? Is that under our heading as well? But just in terms of the choices that are made about, you know, where you extend sewer to or water and so on. I know, for example, like Harkness Road in some of those areas, but that again will affect the, some of the bigger picture issues about where people settle. Yeah. And what the yeah, environmental a, costs are. That's a great point. And yeah, sort of along the lines of of the communication piece, it's not a, a topic that we've covered in depth so far, but certainly something that is within the purview of this group to look at and to think about. So um, definitely would love to hear more um, from you on that. And I also was hoping, because you used a term that I think is a little bit of a um, technical term that perhaps not all um, folks on the, the call are familiar with, so I was hoping you could um, speak a little bit to the idea of complete streets and what that means. Okay. Um, well, Jeff probably can speak to complete streets better than I, but um, so Amherst actually has a complete streets plan and, and part of it is just envisioning the, the street network as like serving just not cars, like serving bikes and serving other users as well and trying to do them in a way you know, where it is friendly and accessible to like all users, that's the way I see it. So it's not just about moving cars as fast as you can, but involves a lot of traffic calming and other factors that make, um, that make them a more hospitable environment, particularly for people who don't feel comfortable biking or walking in very car-centric places with lots of traffic and very unfriendly intersections. That's awesome. Thank you. So it's sort of the idea of shifting the emphasis away from cars when we're thinking about planning streets and, and more to the experience of being a pedestrian, being a cyclist, and, and trying to serve all of the, the different needs that those streets support. Um, would you? Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Um, great. Thank you for for explaining that further. I think that was really helpful. Um, so we do have quite a bit more time. So I wanna open it up to folks just generally to build off of the comments of others, to share other thoughts they might have about any of the issues that have come up, whether it's one of these ideas or something that's missing, something that's been talked about but hasn't shown up on this list. Um, and also to hear from folks we haven't heard from yet including Darcy, I'm just realizing. So maybe yeah. Darcy, you can uh, oh, jump yes. in. Good, hi. Um, yeah, I, um, I think these uh, goals are all um, really good. Uh, I, would, I, would I would also change the first so that it's um, more um, uh, stating a um, just increase public transit as opposed to commit to advocating for. Um, even though it's, you know, it's going to be difficult because public transit, transit is regional. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I have felt that there are a number of issues that we haven't been able to get to in this group and um, including um, uh, really expanding access to pedestrian and bicyclists, which we just did mention. Um, you know, what is it? Something like half of the Amherst population is between the ages of 18 and 25, which is crazy. Um, <laughs> But it's because of our student population, obviously. And so that just seems like it's um, got a lot of potential for really pushing bicycle use, um, even though 
you know, a lot of our population is also very, you know, much older and um, they tend obviously not to be the ones that are probably going to be riding bicycles. But anyway, so that and also I really feel like we should um, be including promoting EV ownership, electric vehicle ownership, and just general electrification of the transportation and heating sectors. Um, you know, changing over our municipal fleet to electric and changing over our, you know, our um, encouraging, encouraging residents to buy electric vehicles if they are vehicle owners. And this has a, this would have a, you know, a, the a indirect effect of reducing pollution for everyone. Um, so it's, it's not that it wouldn't have any co-benefit to um, environmental justice communities. Um, so, you know, that and carpooling, you know, encouraging carpooling, people riding together, um, remote work, uh, someone just mentioned, which I think Laura did, um, you know, encouraging that because that, whatever can take fossil fuel powered cars off the road, um, which is, you know, big piece of the transportation um, piece. And I think Zero Waste Amherst um, sent a communication to this group about its, um, its suggestions for actions for us. So um, it seems like this group should get that so that we yeah, can absolutely. get it. We can certainly send that out um, for everyone to dig into. So does anyone uh, want to build off of Darcy's comments there, or add to anything that was just said? Stephanie. Sure. Um, one of the um, alternatives that was kind of explored fairly recently was the idea that we could maybe have an electric vehicle that was a car share program. So similar to Zipcar, but something that actually lived and was housed at the apartment complexes. And, um, you know, it was a, an idea actually that sort of came from PVPC. Uh, Catherine Rete had reached out and had um, talked to a few of us about that. And we just weren't able to sort of bring it together, but it does seem like something that should be possible somehow at some point. Um, I think part of it would also take some buy-in from the complex owners uh, to allow for that to happen. But I just think if we're looking at all of the possibilities that exist, that's something that would be, you know, shared ownership of an electric vehicle at a complex would, would make sense. Um, you know, there's uh, part of the reason it didn't take flight was because there's also a lot of, you know, um, questions about, own, you know, who would ultimately own it and, um, you know, the insurance and there's no sort of established, uh, we didn't have a sort of an established program, um, if, as it were, but, you know, that may be something that maybe at some point will develop, um, you know, maybe Zipcar will, you know, um, have more of a presence in town. Thanks, Stephanie. That's, that's a new one for me. So very cool to hear um, that that's something that is being considered. Can I ask a, I feel like I missed something at the end of what you just said. You were talking about a car owned by the town that could live at the housing complex. And then you were also talking about zip car just being more prevalent in Amherst. Can you just tie that Sure. So the car wasn't going to be owned by the town. Um, yeah. We were, and that was part of the problem. <laughs> so, um, because it wasn't something that the town would necessarily take the responsibility for. In fact, the idea was maybe that the complex would own the vehicle. Mm 
mm -hmm. um, which was going to require buy-in from the complex owners. So it was complicated, obviously. Um, but but there are things about it that certainly have uh, merit. What I was saying is that Zipcar could potentially be, you know, in the absence of something like a program along those lines, that maybe Zipcar could have more of a presence in the town um, because there's not, you know, right now it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of opportunity uh, for Zipcar sharing, you know, for those, especially in more remote locations. Um, it would be nice to see them at all of the complexes. Yeah, so multiple yeah. potential ways of moving forward with that. Um, yeah, that's great. Or you could do it like the bicycles that they have in town. <laughs> yeah, Penny, would you say more about that? Yeah, you could, we could try to figure out a way where um, instead of like putting it on the apartment complex, maybe the apartment that you rent came with a zip car or uh, some kind of electric um, vehicle where you're renting the you would be like you would be renting the apartment like you would be renting the vehicle or <laughs> or it, it, instead because if you put it on the apartment complex then then now you're you're dealing with insurance but <laughs> Most people who um, um, deal with zip cars, they have private insurance. Mm -hmm. So you could do it that way where there could be like maybe 20 cars to, uh, um, to uh, Watts, uh, I forget the apartment complex. And out of that 20 cars, you would just put in your time or schedule a time where you could use the car for a certain amount of hours. And then if people weren't safe with the car, the car would just shut down if it left like out of Hadley. You know, do you understand what I mean? Like there could be different kinds of stipulations on using the vehicles, but mm -hmm. I think that would be a really cool idea. Um, I'm just going to jump awesome. in to follow that thought because with the bike share program, we actually have what's called geofencing. And it's basically just, you know, there are some remote controls that the uh, the program, the bicycle program, you know, owners of, of that, the software that they use sort of allows them to, to identify kind of a, a usable area. So that's not like a far-fetched idea at all. Um, about that kind of thing, that kind of technology. Yeah, awesome. And it sounds like Penny, you're also saying that the the private insurance is a real barrier for some folks, and and having that um, no longer be an issue would make it significantly easier in terms of. Yeah, it would make yeah. it a little bit easier because. Um, I mean, I guess the town, we could, it could be where the town could uh, offer some type of insurance, but not to make it so the town would go broke, but people would pay into it, um, you know, and it would all be through where you lived and, yeah. it, you know, doing it that way. So it, it doesn't hold um, too much of a burden on the town and too much of a burden on the apartment complex and the yeah. person consuming it. Kind of like crowdfunding in a exactly. way. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Very can cool. And it put it into your rent where, or your subsidy, or if you had a subsidy, I, you know, where one parent, one person out of the household could drive it or try to, you know, figure it out. And then the, I love seniors, this. <laughs> the seniors could use it too, where if there was a senior who could be able to drive, you know, they would be able to drive their senior friends. Totally. Absolutely. This is great creative thinking, Penny. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Love, I see your hand raised. Did you want to follow up on that? Yeah, I think just uh, riffing off of Penny's idea with sort of alternatives to a zip car type thing um, and the insurance piece of that, 
Um, I'm also just thinking about what are the alternative mechanisms to in some way make rides through something like Lyft um, more accessible. And uh, there was a um, brief, well, may still be going on. We had applied for a set of them and didn't happen to get it, but um, there was a program actually through the company Lyft that was providing free rides or basically using Lyft drivers to do things like pick up groceries and bring them to people who couldn't leave their homes and those kinds mm -hmm. of things. It was uh, free for the consumer, but the driver still got paid. And so it was, of course, you know, providing employment and also doing that. So I don't know if there's, you know, as we're thinking about sort of these creative solutions, there's something there that, um, you know, there are also there are people who need cars to get to work and there are also people who need work and there's a nice matchup there in terms of uh, helping to meet both of those needs in some way. Yeah, I really appreciate that thinking about it from both of those angles, not just in terms of getting people around, but also as a sort of form of, of job creation too. I'm putting those things together. Awesome. We have a few more minutes. Yeah, Tracy. I mean, there are some community-based transportation programs, like I remember hearing a while back about one in Portland. I mean, I think it's it seems like it's something where, you know, working with private companies might work best or like community organizations. Because I do think, I mean, just like with some bike sharing programs, they don't work so well because of like maintenance issues and things. So you also have maintenance with cars and liability and the fact that, you know, there's such a range of like um, safety of drivers and so on. Um, I mean, if, if there's some particular apartment complexes in Amherst that seem open to that, I mean, like maybe like the co-ops or something, but it does seem that some apartment owner, owner complex owners in Amherst are quite risk averse and not really open mm -hmm. so much to community engagement. But in Portland, one program they had, it primarily I think served seniors who were no longer driving, but that people could you know, give their cars to the program and then they would basically have credits for rides and then they would have accessible transportation like 24 seven based on the credit. I mean, so one issue with like paratransit services or or bus services, particularly paratransit, a lot of times is that the hours are really limited. The types of trips that you're able to use it for are really limited too. So you really do need to look to other models like ride sharing and other things too. But there's some good programs out there who have done some good car sharing and bike sharing. So yeah, just a few ideas. Yeah, I think you also raised another really important point around sort of collaboration with apartment complexes and that's, that's been another um, recurring theme throughout our, our various task group conversations around sort of how, how much um, property managers and, um, and owners have an influence over what types of initiatives are possible in, in apartment complexes specifically and, and sort of what that means for our climate action plan, which is that those folks need to be brought into the conversations around these issues so that we can move forward with these types of awesome creative ideas like the one that Penny's putting forward um, and in a way that's equitable that also meets the local needs um, and reflects things like car ownership um, and, and sort of access to transit and all the other uh, factors that come into play there. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, so we have a couple more minutes. I want to uh, just check in with Tessa because we haven't heard from her in a while, see if she wants to add anything. And then Darcy, I saw you had a, a hand up as well. Uh, Tessa, how's this conversation landing with you? What's coming up for you? Um, it's a little hard. My audio has been coming in and out for a little bit of it. There's a lot. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. There's just a lot of people in my house on the like Wi-Fi doing other Zoom call thingies. But mostly, I mean, conversations definitely kept up well. I like that we've been able to stay on track, I guess, and like kind of all keep it all about climate change and everyone's been able to have good input, I guess, and I've been able to follow mostly well. So it's been good to keep up with the conversation. Awesome, thank you. And also, 
thank you for sharing that very real experience of being on Wi-Fi at the same time as lots of other folks and competing for that bandwidth because that connects directly back to our conversation about communication and access to internet and how how important that is for staying connected to things like local governance processes like this meeting that we're in right now. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, Darcy. Yeah, I just want to build on what you said about, um, you know, make, having relationships with the um, apartment uh, managers and landlords. Um, because one of the things that, you know, if, if we were going to try to build the um, bicycle network in, in Amherst and try to get the students at the apartment complexes to, instead of having, you know, feel, feel like they could conceivably commute by bicycle is just, they have to have more, um, more bike racks and they need to have um, storage space for bicycles. Uh, because if they don't have store, you know, if they don't have a place to put their bicycle, um, then they probably won't get one. Um, so anyway, it's all related. And that's the kind of thing that you do if you're supporting um, bicycle use. Right. That's a great point, too, that it's not just about the networks and, and building out the networks. It's also about building out the infrastructure to support those networks like the storage, like the bike racks that that help people um, be able to own a bike and keep it locked up and, and have it there for them when they need it. Awesome. So we're going to transition to um, the next part of the conversation, but just wanted to check in, see if anyone had any last comments on these actions on the conversation so far before we move on. So we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit. I just wanted to say one thing. I think it's really important for us to get the apartment complex managers on board of what we're trying to do. Because if we don't get them on board, then it's like useless. And it's just really important that we get them on board in every aspect of what we're trying to do. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thanks, Benny. That's a very important point. It's, it's clear that the apartment complex managers have a lot of influence over how decisions get made and what and what's possible. And so absolutely having them on board is going to be key to moving forward. Because there might be some government um, supplement that they could be using for themselves if they're providing all this um, of what we're asking, you know, of, you know, keeping our environment clean and, you know, so they could yeah, you know, there might be some incentives yeah sorry go, go ahead yeah that's what i was trying to say no, that's i think you put it perfectly there might be things that they they can get out of it that will be beneficial to them as well exactly thank you that's a great great note to leave this conversation on um so as i mentioned um we're gonna shift gears a little bit i'm gonna stop sharing my screen so we can all see each other um, and thank you all for those great thoughts and ideas um, on on the actions and the additions that you're making because clearly those actions are are not everything and are um, are there to be built on so thank you for all of that great input um, so the next part of the conversation we wanted to frame as sort of a reflection on the process so far um, we're getting toward the end of our third meeting together. I know not everyone has been with us throughout, but um, even just being here over the last hour and a half, you can get a sense that this process has been a little bit different and has felt different to folks than, than some of the other processes, um, governance processes in town in the past. And so we wanted to, um, give folks the opportunity to sort of reflect on that. And we wanted to hear from you about what that's meant. Um, so a couple of questions, and we'll do it the same way that we did this last conversation, where we'll hear from everyone, give everyone three minutes to sort of share their thoughts. 
And then if we have more time left over at the end, we'll continue the discussion and, and sort of open it up to whoever would like to comment. So um, first of all, did you think this was a worthwhile process? Um, and if yes, what made it special? If no, what didn't work? And what could be improved uh, to make it better next time? So give everyone a minute or two to, to mull that over. And then we can open it up and just raise your hand when you're ready to jump in. Um, I can share first. Uh, oh, good. Go ahead, Tessa. My overall experience. Yeah. What's what's been good? What um, what could be improved? And and was this a worthwhile experience for you? Okay. Um. Well, first of all, definitely a worthwhile experience. Um. With not having much to do when Corona first started, it was good to like get involved and have a set routine thing like even set meetings like this were a good way to stay active and it was a great way of me getting connected with my community and also learning more about like how town government works and getting used to zooms and stuff and talking online definitely helped the connection into going back to school online much easier so just awesome. learning from and especially the huge diversity we have in these meetings and hearing all the viewpoints on climate change, which is so important to me, was also very educational for myself and helped me expand all my ideas and perspectives surrounding climate change and just learning more about making actual change in our community and knowing that other people have these same interests have been huge benefits to me overall. So it, the whole experience was very moving. Thanks, Tessa. That's really wonderful to hear and really appreciate you sharing. <laughs> I don't know if you can see everyone, but you're getting lots of jazz hands, so. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I just want to admit that I'm a little teary-eyed. <laughs> <laughs> well, feel free to raise your hand and jump in whenever you're ready. We want to hear your honest thoughts too. So, all feedback welcome. I'll share. Uh, so it's been a, a, a range of experiences for me. I was delighted to be part of this, and um, there were a lot of things that were were surprises for me. Pleasant surprises. Um, I wasn't expecting this to be a different process than, than I've experienced in other meetings. And, and so that was, uh, and so I loved the intentionality, the diversity, um, the whole range of meeting all of you representing all different parts of, of life and in town. Um, and so I think that's been hugely valuable. Like I have learned so much about uh, th those different areas. Um, some things that have been challenging for me are um, it's some of the goals have just felt a little um, elusive and, and the process I'm, I'm very process oriented. I'm, discovering <laughs> um, that um, for me, it'd be really helpful to have kind of laid out what each of the three weeks was going to look at, where we were starting, what we wanted to end up with, and then what will happen from here. Um, how um, I have a little bit of the time frame, um, but how would things be implemented? How I, 
might we continue to be involved in that? Um, and um, yeah, maybe hearing or seeing, maybe we still can some of the, the goals presented from the other groups. And, um, and yeah, so I was just also a bit surprised to see such a short list of goals come out of this group and so will the other ones be considered so just I'm, I'm left with with kind of some some questions yeah, yeah but it's, absolutely but, yeah but it's been a wonderful um, process thank you thanks Brenda I, yeah um, I appreciate so many things about what you said um, and I think the first one is is sort of um, you were speaking to the process orientation and um, and sort of the difficulty of wrapping your mind around a process that is less clearly articulated at the outset. And I do appreciate that. And I also appreciate folks for bearing with us as we've um, forged ahead without that structure. Um, part of that has been intentional in the sense of really wanting folks to be present um, with exactly what's happening in the moment and, and not be so focused on outcomes as to lose sight of the people and the relationships and this, this sort of experiences that are being shared in, in the meetings. Um, so I completely appreciate that that is a challenge, um, especially in the context of how these types of meetings usually are run. Um, and it is a, a comment that we got in our last um, meeting as well with the land use group um, and one of the co-chairs made a great comment that I, I really appreciated, which was that even though these meetings have felt sort of slower um, and, and almost like we've done less, the results have still been incredibly rich and we've learned so much. Um, and what we've learned is really ground truth in, in, in the diversity of experiences that are in this room. And that is so valuable. Um, so just really want to appreciate um, you for bringing that up. Um, I'll also just say that in terms of the next steps and how this group and all of the task group members can, be, can continue to be involved, I promise I will touch on that before the end of this meeting. I'm going to give an overview of the timeline moving forward and ways that we want to stay connected. So that will not be lost. Um, and then I would also say that, um, yes, absolutely, things that are coming out of the other groups will be shared with all the groups. Um, so we'll, we'll circle back to that towards the end of our meeting today, um, but just want to say rest assured that that is not going to, to be lost and you all will have the opportunity to see um, what's coming out of the other groups and to um, to continue to participate in the creation of the plan and shape what's coming out of the process. So, thank you. <sighs> Anyone like to go next? Okay, so hi. So um, I, so I think, I mean, what I appreciated most about this process is um, just that it really did focus on hearing about different people's experiences. And as you said, there's such a wide range of experiences and really allowing opportunity for input um, because there's so many community planning processes where public input or even you know input of the group members is pretty limited and it's done in a often in a predetermined framework about you know that um, people are asked to give input on a very small topic and really aren't allowed to say but wait what about these other things so i appreciate how you you know, allowed opportunity for people to raise issues that maybe like hadn't been on the radar before or whatever. So that that seemed really, really valuable to me. 
And, um, and there's a lot of great things about this process and I wish that some other planning processes were more like that. Um, but a lot of um, a lot of Brenda's comments resonated with me. Um, I mean, so one thing is that I, you know, was trained professionally as like a community planner. And so I've done, I've been part of planning processes both as a volunteer and professionally. And I do have concerns about, you know, the next steps and about all the beautiful plans that have been written that sit on shelves and how, you know, for years and even decades, sometimes like we're still in the same place, like trying to ask for the same changes um, and improvements to make life better for all of us. And so, you know, it's just that change can be so, so incremental and just take so long. And um, so, I mean, I was a little disappointed that the, um, you know, all the comments that people made, like they boiled down to those four that were sent around to us because, and I do hope that there is room and the opportunity to incorporate more of the other ideas that were expressed because I think there were a lot of good ones. Um, and just about next steps and how things are implemented and what, you know, as, as this part of the process ends and recommendations are delivered to the town, like where does it go after that? Um, because I would hope that, you know, there would then be an implementation committee and process to make sure that that is happening, but that doesn't always happen with plants, as beautiful and wonderful as they are. So I'm a little jaded about that implementation step, but thank you. Thanks for sharing, Tracy. And I, I want to even maybe open it up to our co-chairs to speak a little bit to um, sort of the role of the ECAC as the stewards of this plan um, and, and sort of guiding the implementation. Um, Laura or Darcy, did either of you want to speak to that? Sure, I can. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's our main goal as a committee. Um, and, and I would just offer up that, um, and, and Darcy, please correct me if I'm speaking for you, but I think Darcy and I are both on this um, sort of pathway with everyone in terms of a different way of engaging on a with with our community on a plan um we also are process people and so we've been having to learn a little bit about how to think about things differently um and so um but yes i think what what we hope to get out of this of this work is is community ownership and interest and um, support of a plan that's supporting our community and not only meeting, in, in meeting climate change in a way that, um, or, or acting on climate change in a way that makes us more resilient, more thriving as a holistic community, not just as pieces of the community. Thank you. <laughs> More jazz hands. Stephanie, yeah. Um, I guess I just wanted to say from my perspective of working for the town as long as I have and really doing this work now for decades, um, you know, we created a plan that did sit on a shelf, but a big reason for that, which I've been cautioned not to say, but I think is true, is that there wasn't the kind of acceptance and awareness that I think we have now. Um, we didn't, I mean, we have a select, uh, we had a select board, but we now have a town council that adopted a goal of carbon neutrality. I think we're in a very, very different place than we were before. I think, you know, and I, I think the awareness to me is, it, it goes beyond, you know, our community. I think there's sort of, you know, a, a more global imperative um, that people are understanding more now. And because back two de decades ago, um, when we were starting this work, there were certainly predictions and we're meeting some of those unfortunate predictions of accelerated change that are coming to fruition, you know, the worst case scenario, if you will. So I 
I really think there's a call to action that I think is being embraced by the town governance in a way that I haven't seen before. So the fears about this kind of sitting on a shelf, I think we have an imperative now and a, or a directive, I should say, by the town council that's going to move us to having to implement a lot of the things. And I think that's where, you know, when a plan, a plan is developed, the ECAC will certainly be helping to guide it, but the implementation happens, you know, really at the department level and at the town level. And the way in which we engage with the community will be hopefully, um, the ECAC will be driving a lot of that. Um, so there's different levels in which we'll be engaging. And I think, I don't know, I feel hopeful. And this process really was really makes me very, very hopeful as well. I would also build on um, what you said around sort of the leadership of the, the town council and um, in setting the goals and, and sort of the, the ethos that is around us and the, the increased awareness of the issues related to climate change and sort of the impacts that we're seeing. I think there's what we've learned through these meetings is also that there is incredible community interest in tackling climate change and a lot of great energy and ideas to bring to the table. And so I think our, our hope with these sessions is, is at least a little bit to, to make those connections between climate action and, and our everyday lives and how interconnected those things are. Um, and so all of those things are required, the leadership and governance and the sort of energy from the community and, and, um, and connecting those things. So thank you. So we haven't heard from Penny, from Jeff, from Darcy, and I know we've lost Lev, unfortunately. Um, I'm not sure if she'll be able to come back, but hopefully, hopefully she'll be back and we'll be able to hear from her as well. Well, I just think it's really important that we um, try to execute what we talked about. And um, we all keep an open mind that we want to make our town better and um, healthier and um, uh, just peaceful and we all have to work together. You know, it takes a village and we have lots of villages around us with different types of people, ethnic, eth I can't even say it, but I think you guys know what I'm saying. And um, it's just uh, really um, important to uh, keep the door open for, um, to get this done. And uh, I am I had a good time uh, in this group. <laughs> um, it was a learning experience. I've been in Amherst since the 70s. I've gone to the Amherst High School, junior high, middle uh, grade school, and the, my kids have too. So yeah. it's important that um, I wanna grow old here and uh, I want my grandkids too be able to do that too. And uh, I just want our community to be um, successful and prosperous and happy. So that's, that's all I have to say. Thanks so much, Penny. I also, um, if it's okay with you, I want to ask a, a follow up question there. Um, because you said that this was a, a big learning experience for you. Um, so I'm curious, what's the what's the biggest thing you're taking away that you learned or that um, yeah, that you're still thinking about? Um, hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm still on the, the, what I'm taking away is, is that I've met a lot of good people and everyone has such awesome ideas that I just hope that they're executed and that we can find the funds to be able to help our community out because it's all about community and keeping us healthy and um, on the straight and narrow. Okay. And um, it's, it's been nice working with everybody. And uh, um, yeah. 
that's all I can say. It's been a great having you. And yeah, thank you for that. And you also raised a really important point about funding and and aligning funding with all of these great ideas yeah, that folks have been sharing. Done unless we have money to be able to fund what we're trying to do for the people who don't have any money. Exactly. So yeah. Yep. Thanks so much. Thank you. So Jeff, Darcy? Sure. If you I'll, haven't shared I'll go yet. Ahead. I'd be glad to add my two bits. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. uh, having the chance to participate, even in a somewhat limited capacity. But I have to say, in in all my years of planning, I've never experienced such an open and discord and uh, welcoming environment for discussion. Is something that many of us are very passionate about, and uh, I have to credit you for uh, the group for creating a very a welcoming atmosphere. I mean, many of these areas are something that I'm not an expert in, but I felt very safe and secure in expressing my opinion. And I, I think that's just a huge testament to this process. So thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I'm glad to hear that. I hope that's something that will carry forward throughout. Stephanie. Do you want to add Sorry. to that? Um, so we just heard from Lev, unfortunately, um, one of her children had a minor injury. And so she had to, mm. um, had to get home and um, regretted that she missed a bunch of the process and really appreciated being included and hoped that her participation was helpful to the group. So I just wanted to convey that to everyone on her behalf. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, hopefully we can follow up with her um, and give her the opportunity to reflect on the process as well, because I'm sure we'd all love to hear um, her thoughts on that too. Yes, she did say she's happy to follow up further. I see, I think. Oh, great. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I was just going to turn to Darcy. I think um, we haven't heard from you yet on this question. Yeah, I... I, I also think, you know, really appreciate that this um, was creating a really safe space for people to talk about these issues pretty, pretty broadly and, um, and that it wasn't, it's new, a new way of doing things. So obviously, you know, there are different process issues probably to work through that we would do differently. If you know, the next time around or whatever. Um, I am also a big process person. So I also related to what Brenda said um, about um, just feeling, um, you know, all along, I sort of felt like I wanted more, um, I wanted us to all have more, um, sort of structure and more documents, maybe a packet or something ahead of time so that people could uh, really know what's going, what was going to happen at the meeting and mm -hmm. have some kind of uh, a basis for um, discussion and, um, and you know, I would have liked to have seen a uh, a, you know, like a, a full list or a comparison to what some other town had done so that the, the group could have looked at, you know, okay, so what, what did this town do with their climate action plan or um, so that we could visualize m more clearly what we're doing. Um, so, um, but I do appreciate that this was sort of cutting edge as far as being inclusive and being, um, uh, you know, like there was a lot of stuff that I learned that I never would have learned in any other context. Um, and I really do appreciate that a lot. And I'm assuming that that's gonna get into our action plan. 
Um, yeah. Can you say a bit more about that, about um, some of the things that you learned that you're taking away? Um, oh, uh, I learned, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff about the, um, you know, trying to get the route to the, to the bike path from the Hadley apartment complexes and also all of the information about, um, you know, how many bags you can take on, a, on the PVTA. I didn't know that. Um, and that's all very, um, you know, pertinent to, you know, putting together a transportation plan. Um, you know, that you can't necessarily go to the grocery store because you can't bring three bags of groceries. <laughs> so that was all new to me and very, uh, yeah. like really interesting and relevant. Awesome. Thanks for sharing those thoughts and, and for sticking with us um, in spite of the, the um, unique framing of the process, let's, let's say. Um, so we have a little bit of extra time. We're going to wrap up at six, um, possibly a few minutes early. Um, so I just wanted to open it up to folks if they had any last thoughts on how this process has been, um, desire to respond to the comments that others have made, um, or any sort of closing thoughts, um, that folks want to share before we wrap up. All right, so as promised, um, I wanted to just touch on next steps for the plan. Um, so after this third round of task group meetings concludes, we have um, two more sets of meetings. Um, with, we already had the land use meeting. We're gonna have um, a meeting about renewable energy uh, and then another one about buildings um, in the next couple weeks. And then once those wrap up, um, we're going to be working on developing a more fleshed out list of strategies based on all of the wonderful ideas that have come up in these conversations, as well as conversations with other folks like town staff, like um, other local stakeholders, um, like the ECAC um, co-chairs, and like some of the groups that you all are a part of, like Zero Waste Amherst, um, who, as Brenda and Darcy both mentioned, has um, sent a list of, of uh, their priorities that they would like to see uh, reflected in the plan. Um, so we encourage everyone to reach out with any thoughts that you have or ideas for actions. Um, anything that comes up in, in the meantime, um, please be in touch. We want to hear from you. Um, and that when I say we want to hear from you, that I, I'm speaking for myself, for Jim and Stephanie and Gazi Kaya. Um, who had to leave, um, and Darcy and Laura as well. Uh, we all want to hear from you and want to um, continue to uh, have these conversations um, offline or online, but outside of the context of our meetings. Um, so when once we come up with that list of strategies, um, our plan is to connect back with this group and with some others that have given input um, to um, to share those strategies, to connect with family and friends about these strategies, to really make sure that we got, we got them right, um, that they're really reflecting the, the ideas, the priorities, the principles um, that we've discussed together and that you all have shared. Um, the hope is that the dialogue is going to continue over the next several months as we develop those strategies and start prioritizing them and turning them into a plan. Um, and a draft plan is going to be presented to the community in the spring. So that will be another, uh, a big meeting, an opportunity to provide further input um, and continue to influence and craft the plan before it gets finalized and presented to the town council, um, which will be in April. Um, so that's sort of our, our timeline for developing the strategies and developing the plan. Um, and with that, I just want to um, 
say thank you so much for your participation, for taking the time to be here with us, for sharing your ideas, your thoughts so generously, um, for really investing in this process. We really hope that you'll continue to participate um, as we move forward with developing the plan, that you'll share with your friends and family and neighbors and, and folks that, um, that could be part of this too. Um, and at, like I said, don't hesitate to reach out to us in the meantime. We will be following up with sort of the notes from this meeting, uh, a summary of all of these next steps as well. So you have that documented um, to refer back to. Um, and I will just um, say, yeah, Stephanie. <laughs> Sorry, before you, you um, exit off this uh, meeting, I just wanted to say mm -hmm. that um, we all really want to thank you, the Linnaean team, um, for, for this process and really um, working with the ECAC mm -hmm. and to our ECAC co-chairs for, um, you know, embracing what I know was a little unusual <laughs> and and really being willing to go there um, and just thank you all for such a rich experience it was really wonderful and I do want, want to say too that um, I am at town hall well usually a town hall but I'm available and if anyone ever at some point even beyond this process years down the road and hopefully I'll still be there but you know if anyone ever wants to reach out to me um, I'm I'm always you know, willing and eager to uh, hear from community members and open for any thoughts or um, ideas or questions. So please feel free to reach out at any time. Thanks, Stephanie. I also want to just acknowledge Gizzy Kaya and all of the amazing work that they've done to put this together and, and to support the group's process. I know that they had to leave us uh, a little bit unexpectedly, but um, just extremely grateful for all their work. I know that they've been really key in supporting uh, the progress that we've made. So um, just want to give that shout out as well. All right, folks, it's a few minutes before six o'clock. So we'll let everyone get to dinner a little early. Um, and please be in touch and you'll hear from us soon. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye, Penny. Bye, you Bye too. everyone. Take Bye, care. Tessa. Thanks, Penny. Bye. Thanks, Tessa. Bye, Brenda. Good night. Thanks, Brenda. Bye, Tracy. Good working with you guys. You, you too. too, Penny. I hope to see more of you going forward. I would Same. like to see Take that care. too. Take care. Bye bye. Good. Bye. Yeah, you too. Um, I just stopped recording. Uh, no, you haven't. Still recording.